It's great to be with you this evening. I'm not sure where everyone is tuning in from, but it's great to be with you and to present, as we've already been hearing, uh, the greatest message that could ever be shared. The story, the message of how a sinner sent, um, a Savior sent into this world could save a sinner. And we're, we're so um, honored tonight to be able to share this message with, with each one this evening. So I'd like to read together um, in the book of Matthew in chapter 27 this evening. If you have a Bible on your phone or on a tablet or uh, in your home there, if not, uh, just follow along. I'll try and read slowly and clearly. And we're going to read in Matthew chapter 27. And verse number 15 is where we'll start. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 15. And it says this. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would or whoever they wanted. And they had been and and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas. And destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the two will you that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do, do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. I'd just like to read one verse more in John in chapter 18. John's Gospel, chapter 18, the same account that we'll be reading of, but another verse that presents um, another point that I'd like to emphasize this evening, that I'd like to impress upon your heart. And it's found in John chapter 18 and verse number 40. The last verse of John chapter 18. Again, this same scene that Jesus and Barabbas have been presented to the people. And it says John chapter 18 and verse 40. Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. This evening, dear friend, listening into this gospel message, I would like to present this truth to you from the word of God, of a decision that was made one day, some 2,000 years ago, when the people were presented with a man called Jesus Christ, and they said, not this man, but Barabbas. What friend would you do tonight with Jesus Christ? Would you choose him? Would you come to him and say, this man, he's the one for me, the only savior of sinners? Or would you be like the multitude that day and they would choose someone else? Maybe tonight you would choose something else. Oh, friend, tonight I hope your answer, after listening to this gospel message, would not be like that crowd and say, not this man, but you would say, this man, he's the one for me, the only savior of sinners. The date was September 8th, 1974, when the then sitting president, Gerald Ford, granted Richard Nixon a full and unconditional pardon for any crimes he might have committed against the United States while president. In particular, this pardon covered Nixon's actions during the Watergate scandal, very infamous scandal. And in a televised broadcast to the nation, it was Gerald Ford, the president, the man who had the power to give this pardon, 
He said this. He explained the reasons why he did it. And he said it was a tragedy for Nixon and for his family and that they would never get out from under the shadow of that unless there was pardon. And it could go on and on and on and on. And he said someone must put an end to it. Someone must put an end to it. And addressing the nation, he said this. I have concluded then that only I can do it. And if only I can, I must. A man who saw the purpose before him as being the only one that could deliver this unconditional pardon to one who was guilty. One who had so much evidence piled up against him. He said, I have concluded that only I can do it. And if only I can, then I must. What a day for Richard Nixon. September 8, 1974. An unconditional pardon for all the wrong he had ever done against the people of the United States. You say, what an interesting story. Why does it matter to me? Why would a man's pardon some 40 or, or so years ago have any significance for me today? I've never been involved in a political scandal. I've never really committed a crime of any serious nature against a, a nation, against a group of people. But friend, tonight, you've committed the most heinous crimes against the most holy God. Our sin has made us enemies with God, has put us at enmity with God. But there was a day, a day in the annals of time, in eternity past, when a voice could be heard from heaven saying, who shall I send? Who shall go for us? And there's a voice that came out. Not one of Gerald Ford. No doubt a powerful, a mighty man who did many mighty deeds, but a different voice came forth, a voice from the Son of God. And he said, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And tonight, friend, we have read the fulfillment of that, of that purpose of Christ. So many years ago, when the mediator stood between heaven and earth and took upon himself the sin the penalty that we so rightly deserve. It was as if Christ said, I have concluded that only I can do it. And if only I can do it, then I must. And friend, tonight he said, I must because he loved your soul and he wanted to save you. He said, I must because he saw from eternity past one who needed a savior. No matter where you're sitting tonight, friend, no matter where you may find yourself in whatever situation of life, young, old, single, married. Friend, you have a soul. And Christ died that you might have a pardon, an unconditional pardon, not based upon what we could do, what we could ever muster. Up. That man, Richard Nixon, helpless, hopeless, but there came a voice, pardoned, forgiven, justified. The sinner can look to Calvary and there receive a pardon for crimes committed against God. And I would just like to simply think this afternoon about this, this story, this account that we have encountered in the word of God. And just think how it was a very important day for three different groups of people. And we come here and we've read a little bit that on this day of atonement. The Jews had this practice of requesting from the Roman, Roman government that since the day they had been delivered out of Egypt, that they thought it would be fitting that each year a prisoner would be released to symbolize the freedom, the, the release from captivity that the Jews had enjoyed. There was no law for it. There was no biblical um, commandment for it in the Bible. But seemingly the Roman government decided to grant to the Jews this 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 pardon. And so each each year it said at, at, at the feast at, at this great religious feast, it said there was a custom for a prisoner to be released. And here we have a gathering in of many different people, a great crowd there. And I would like to think how it was an important day for the crowd that day. A diverse crowd, no doubt. People from different areas different backgrounds, different upbringings, different social classes. The rich and the poor would have been there. Many different people. 
Well, they had two things in common. The first one, they were all sinners. Didn't matter how far someone had come to Jerusalem. It didn't matter how much they had sitting on their property, how much livestock they had, how many barns they had. They had this in common. They were all sinners. Some adulterers. Some had been unfaithful to their spouses, no doubt. Some had lives maybe marked by lying to get an advantage in their business. Others might have been thieves. Others, idolaters, worshiping, falling down before false gods. They were all sinners. And friend, you have that in common tonight with this crowd. You could have been found amongst the number that day. And you had a lot in common with them. Maybe sins that are, are more, more, more fitting, more seen in the, in the century in which we live. But still a sinner. Friend, you have that in common. They were all sinners. But the second thing they had in common. That that day. They were presented with Christ. Every one of them. Jesus Christ was brought forth and declared by his judge. Behold the man. And that crowd that day they would have looked up and they would have seen the Lord Jesus. Maybe some even having witnessed miracles that he had performed. Maybe some had even been following along, listening to some of his teachings, and they brought him forth. And they said, behold, the man. The one who is the king of kings, the son of God, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. They are presented with him that day. And friend, tonight it is my desire as well that you would have that in common with the crowd. That like the apostle Paul, this message could be focused in. And we could say, I've just, I have determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. We preach Christ crucified. You know, having a message to preach is nothing unique. Even in a, in a virtual setting like this, whether you've uh, attended a church earlier today, but hearing a message preached. Is not all that unique. Uh, a large majority of churches, I would assume, still in some form preach a message each day. But what is preached? What is presented? There was an old brick church down along an old dirt road. Back in the, the country of a town that no one would know the name of. And on the front of that church, that old brick church, it said this. We preach Christ crucified. And they preach that message. They preach Christ crucified. Christ is the savior of sinners. But eventually, the people weren't quite happy with that message. And man's wisdom and, and man's message started to come in to that church. And, and the weeds on top of that church started to, to grow down on front. Until all you could see from that sign was, we preach Christ. But still, what a great message. But yet they would preach Christ, the, the philosopher, Christ, the, the, the businessman, Christ, the, the economic uh, uh, major, all these different things about Christ. They would preach about. It. And over time, the people got restless. And over time, the weeds continued to grow down on front of that church sign. And at the end of the day, all that church said was we preach. Nothing unique about the message. There's nothing unique about preaching. But if you preach Christ crucified, if you hear the message of Christ Jesus being crucified on a cross for sinners, that's something unique. If you hear a message preached that tells that tells you as a, as a lost sinner, there's nothing you can do to ever be saved. Christ did it all. Christ crucified. Something powerful about that. Anything or, or anyone besides him does not compare. In that day, what was the message preached to that crowd on that important day? What did he say? This man hasn't done anything wrong. He's innocent. He's perfect. There's no fault in him. Brings to mind the words of that tremendous hymn. No mortal can with him compare. 
among the sons of men. Fairer is he than all the fair that fill the heavenly train. And you may say when this crowd was presented with Jesus Christ, the perfect innocent one and Barabbas. It says he was a robber. He was a guilty man. He was a criminal. And you may say that crowd that day, what an easy decision for them when they are presented with Christ. How do they respond? They would say, not this man, but Barabbas. And friend, tonight, you are not being presented with another man named Barabbas. But tonight, if you reject Christ, you're just like that crowd. You would say, not this man, but relationships. Not this man. But my pleasure in sin. Not this man. But my pride. Not this man, but but religion. Good works. That's the way for me. Not this man. But you fill in the blank. What's keeping you from Christ tonight, friend? How would you reply tonight if you don't accept Christ? You would say not this man. But something else. Oh, friend, I'm here to tell you tonight there are many, even maybe amongst those whom you are listening to this message to tonight, who have said not this man, but perhaps they said the opposite. They've said this man. I choose this man, Jesus Christ, who died for my sins on the tree. What a tremendous offer of salvation. This man, he's the one for me. Jesus Christ says to you tonight, friend. Believe in me. Come on to me. All you who labor are heavy burdened. Bore, be, be, all all the, the, the weight of your sin is bearing down upon you. All the hopelessness of your sin. Sin that is taking you to a lost eternity. Christ has come to me. Believe in me. Trust in me. And I will give you rest. Would you be like the hymn writer tonight? Who would say these words? Whom have I, Lord, in heaven but thee? None but thee, none but thee. And this my song through life shall be Christ for me, Christ for me. He hath for me the wine press trod. He hath redeemed me by his blood and reconciled my soul to God. Christ for me, Christ for me. Friend tonight, our desire would be that you would choose Christ tonight, that you would come to him, that you would turn from your sins and trust in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. It was an important day for the crowd that day. They chose Barabbas. But it was an important day for an individual that day. That same day that that crowd would have rejected Jesus, there was a man sitting in his jail cell. And maybe he, he had realized sitting there that day that today was the day, the day of my death. The day when I'm going to finally all the all the wrong that I have done is going to catch up with me. And today is the day of my death. Barabbas. Barabbas that day would have been sitting in his jail cell. Maybe he could even see outside the window. He could see that hill where three crosses were going to be placed. Maybe he even knew the other thieves. That he, were to, he was going to be crucified with. It was an important day. For Barabbas. He's a picture of a sinner. He deserved to die. The law demanded the punishment. The penalty for his crimes. For his sins. Crucifixion. Maybe he was a religious man. Maybe he grew up and would go to the synagogue or the temple or wherever it might have been. And maybe he was a religious man. But he got away. Maybe he was a man who was trying by works to, to gain God's favor. And he fell short. Maybe he had been a man who had been on the run for many years. Trying to escape the penalty of his sins as they sought for him. As they looked to put him in prison. But he finally his sins had caught up with him. And friend tonight, no matter how well or how, how um, wise you have become at hiding your sins, maybe from your parents, maybe from a spouse, whoever it might be. The Bible so clearly says, be sure your sins 
will find you out. And that day, Barabbas, his sins found him out in a very big and important way. It was the day of his death. And before God, every sinner is condemned. Every sinner. As Barabbas would have sat in his jail cell that day, what a picture of the sinner, the state of the sinner. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. They have all gone out of the way. They're all together unprofitable. Their mouth, is, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You want to know how God sees the sinner? The rebellious one? The one who has committed sins and crimes, no matter how big or how small we think they might be. It says this in Isaiah. How God sees a sinner from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They've not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. That man Barabbas that day sat in his jail cell, guilty, vile, condemned to death. You would have saw maybe those soldiers coming to this, the, the jail cell. And maybe you would have thought, well, this is it. The time has come. I'm going to receive what I deserve. And that soldier would have opened the door. He would have said he can go free. He can go free. How is it possible that a man as guilty and vile as Barabbas, a criminal, a thief, how could he you know how Jesus Christ took his place on the cross? Literally, the place that he deserved, Jesus Christ took. And friend, tonight, what about you? Could you identify in some way with this man Barabbas? Seeing the, the, the filthiness and the vileness of your sins, knowing judgment is coming. I am going to receive exactly what I deserve. And there comes a knock at your heart's door. And Christ Jesus, because I took the place for Barabbas on the cross, took your place too. It wasn't just an important day for Barabbas. It was an important day for the sinner. What grace. What grace displayed at Calvary that day when Jesus Christ took the place of Barabbas on the cross. There's no comparison between the two. One was guilty, a sinner, vile, before God. The other was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. And only one of those two men went free that day. The other was nailed to a cross. And friend, tonight, the Lord Jesus did not only take Barabbas' place on the cross, he took yours as well. Christ died for our sins. What would you do this evening with Jesus Christ? He's the Savior of sinners. The Savior of sinners. What was it that day that Barabbas would have had to have done? When the soldiers opened that door to his cell and told him he's free to go. He would have said, yeah, well, I don't deserve it. He would have said, oh, that's the truth. He would say, it's so, it's so amazing. It's so unbelievable. I just can't believe it. You know what? God's salvation is so amazing. You know what Barabbas had to do? He just had to walk free. I don't know if Barabbas ever had his soul saved. He had a, a physical salvation that day when he walked and, and maybe went home to his family. I don't know where he went. But maybe as he was walking away that day, he would have turned his head to that, that, to that hill. And he would have seen the cross that he deserved to hang on, that middle cross. He would have seen one hanging there. He would have known. He was there for me. That's what I deserved. And Jesus Christ took my place. What about you tonight, friend? What about you? The crowd that day were presented with Jesus Christ. The son of God, the son of man, the king of kings, 
The Bible says he's the bright and morning star. And they said, not this man. But Barabbas. The Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. He took your place. He took your punishment. The chastisement for our peace was placed upon him. And with his stripes, with his wounds, we are healed. Barabbas was, was rescued. His place was taken and he went free. What about you tonight, friend? The bondage of your sin, the chains that you have. You can be set free tonight. Only through Jesus Christ, the son of God, who took your place on Calvary's tree. Barabbas walked away a free man that day. What about you? Could you say like the like the like the hymn writer of old? Christ for me, Christ for me. Safe in his arms I shall repose. Christ for me, Christ for me. Still will I sing through death's cold shade. Christ for me. Christ for me. Well, friend, tonight, I pray that you would not say towards Christ about God's message of salvation, not this man, but another. I pray tonight that you would simply in faith take what Christ has done for you on the cross. He paid for your sins. He died that you might be free, and he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again, and he sits victorious in heaven tonight, and he invites you to come unto him, to trust in him, believe in him, and he will give you rest in a restless world. He will give you hope in a world full of hopelessness. He will wash you clean from all your sins. Would you say, Christ for me, Christ for me. We pray that you would trust him tonight and have your sins forgiven, have Christ as your savior and receive everlasting life.